आई वी एम वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी अ डेली पॉडकास्ट बाय द तक्षशिला इंस्टीट्यूशन we are a bunch of policy nerds based in bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hello and welcome to all things policy today i have with me an expert from the field of semiconductor electronics a gentleman who once worked at texas instruments also commonly known in the electronic space as ti but he now also works at another ti the takshila institution and his name is pranay kotasthane welcome pranay ha yeah anirudh i'm not an expert but a student but yeah <laughs> okay definitely much more of an expert than i was in my electronics engineering career so I, you are an electronics engineer oh, yes no. yes okay. I, i i studied electronics and instrumentation engineering but i'm not i'm still not totally sure how leds work but let's okay. not get into the, this conversation <laughs> oh i thought i was going to quiz you about all those things well it's, it's, it's a good thing to establish my lack of knowledge right up front so uh, hopefully i've saved myself from that fate um but okay so prana you you recently written this interesting article in the south china morning post about how covid-19 changes the geopolitics of semiconductor supply chains uh, and it's really like kind of brought home to me the fact that um the supply chains of semiconductors are actually far more complex far more globe spanning and far more dependent on the policies of various countries than one would otherwise think i mean the last couple of decades of globalization have gotten all of us used to the idea of like just ordering a phone on amazon and having it delivered to you within a couple of days right but there's actually a whole lot of very very complicated supply chains across various countries involving different kinds of materials that really go into something even as simple as a cell phone um so can you tell us a little bit about what exactly are uh, how exactly does the semiconductor supply chain work what really goes into manufacturing a chip that goes into a phone uh, anirudh so first of all uh, i am one of those persons who believe that in the integrated chip the ic is the one that actually changed the world and the all the things that we see now computers software etc come because of that particular innovation so that's why my interest in this particular area but hmm. interestingly i was really looking at it from a technological angle you know but uh, a few days back uh, the word surgical strike got used with the semiconductor industry so the news hmm. was that the us is surgical strike on huawei is changing the world and changing things in the semiconductor industry so never in my wild just imagination did i think that this term called surgical strike which we use in our national security domain <laughs> and in bala code strikes and all that right would ever yeah. be used in an industry such as semiconductor industry but hey the hmm. world is different and here we are that hmm. an industry which was so invisible to us right like you rightly said we use a phone and we never even bothered about what goes behind this phone right things just fell into place this was this is the most globally integrated uh, supply chain i would say and yet mm. the most vulnerable right because the the r&d costs are really high so which means that uh, countries and companies are really really specialized at doing one little small thing in this supply chain but it just mm. worked absolutely fine right we didn't even bother about it we didn't know we just got we ordered a phone on amazon and it just got delivered to us but let me just illustrate to you with a few numbers right for example one semiconductor company in the us and this is number is from the semiconductor international association uh, so one uh, particular semiconductor company in the us has around 16000 suppliers all right so mm-hmm. that is the scale that we are talking about and all of these suppliers are spread across the world they are specialized in doing one little uh, thing in the supply chain uh, and yet the whole thing just falls into place because of the invisible hand right so that is how it yeah. now broadly dividing the semiconductor uh, design process uh, right up to the phone that comes to your into your hand we can just divide it uh, into these steps first one is design. design step right so where you actually uh, design the code that 
makes your phone. So basically, uh, you will have a code that uh, decides what the CPU will do or what the graphics processor is supposed to do, so on and so forth, right? That's the first step. Uh, after you have done the design, it goes into something called the manufacturing process. So that's where the actual chip gets made. So something which is the hardware, right? So uh, the design process finally just gives a, a, a mask, okay? It's just basically a bunch of code uh, lines which tell uh, the manufacturing process where does the silicon needs to be etched in order for a particular property to be represented on silicon. So the manufacturing hmm. actually does that on the silicon and after that there is the packaging process which actually uh, makes the black chips which we see on uh, the images etc. And finally there is testing and then there is you know, the whole lot of integration of that integrated chip onto the PCB and then the, finally the phone gets made. So really broadly, these are the four or five steps that go into making something like a uh, phone hardware. So I can imagine that every single one of these processes can be highly specialized. There must be co companies across the world that work on very, very specific domains, right? I remember, so in your article, you mentioned that there's a particular kind of gas that is used in the etching mm. um, that is most that is almost totally dominated by Japanese companies, right? So can you give us a little bit of a picture of uh, what are the various companies involved in this process? Um, how is it that uh, a chip goes from design stage, like physically, how does it go from design stage to the final manufacturer? Right? Which, are the, which are the various countries that are involved? Which are the various companies that are involved? Right. Okay. So... There is a brilliant analogy to describe this. So William Shi at the Harvard Business School described this as a transcontinental relay race with several hurdles in it, right? So it is transcontinental mm -hmm. and yet there are several hurdles. And now what we are seeing is that there are actually countries which are putting hurdles in between in order to stop the other from progressing, right? So now look yeah. at the hurdle. Look, let's look at what is this transcontinental relay race about. So uh, basically what happens happens is each of the steps are specialized to a few countries. Okay, so for example, when we talk about manufacturing, that is converting the code into final uh, etched silicon, that is hmm. done in a in very few countries. So there are uh, just a handful of foundries. Uh, so these are called fabrication units across the world. And uh, in fact, all uh, the model has shifted. There were earlier around 15, 20 companies which used to do that. And now that uh, market has consolidated there are less than 10 companies which do it across the world at, at the cutting edge right and in that as well in the contract manufacturing process Taiwan has a company called the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company or TSMC for short that accounts for nearly half of the world's contract chip marketing share okay so just one company uh, markets that so there's a great chance that whatever phone you're using mostly it has come from this one company in the world the manufacturing Right on the design stage. So if we go up the value chain, the, I told you right. First step is design, where you design the code, etc. For that, there are a large number of companies. In fact, hmm, in I India also, a lot of companies do that work. So uh, that work is uh, that work requires very high uh, human capital, talent uh, of, of people who have worked in electronics, understand coding, etc. So that is not that difficult to uh, have in one place. But this manufacturing, for example, uh, uh, just now TSMC star announced that it is going to build a semiconductor plant in Arizona. And that costs $12 billion. Okay. And th that is not even at the cutting edge. It is like two or three generations behind. But that's $12 billion. Right? That's like 1 lakh crores. That's the amount that Jio raised in the last uh, uh, few months, right? By selling 21% of its stake. That much amount is required to make one semiconductor fab, uh, which is not even at the cutting edge, right? So that's why what you see is that only a few companies do that. Uh, Intel does it, for example because it has a wherewithal, it has been an old player. Then there are a few other com companies like 
global foundries uh, and then there is tsmc which is the behemoth in this right so that's one hmm. then even inside this manufacturing there are several layers of suppliers so for example you spoke about equipment that goes into manufacturing so basically there is one uh, uh, process in this called lithography which is basically the process which tells how do you uh, design really small uh, d- uh, really small you know um, features on the silicon in order to make the transistors work okay so it's basically you can think of it as drawing on the silicon to uh, you know extract particular properties out of it now that particular uh, there's one uh, component called the extreme ultraviolet lithography equipment which is used mm-hmm. at the cutting edge for all this now all the companies whether it's samsung or tsmc just rely on one company called ASML it's a dutch company which has this particular equipment so just imagine if ASML it doesn't supply to someone else then TSMC is manufacturing it's delayed if TSMC is manufacturing it's delayed your apple phone doesn't get produced on time and you won't get it uh, in the store anymore right so that that's again highlights how really fragile the chain is because of how integrated it is and yet how specialized it is yeah the more I- think about it this was the kind of highly specialized manufacturing that is only possible in a world that has low barriers to trade low barriers to the flow of capital low barriers to the flow of talent right um, but in- increasingly this that isn't really the world that we are living in today um, you mentioned an example in your article of of how a semiconductor manufacturing association in the us uh, asked president trump to give them an exception to the covid-19 lockdowns uh, because they wanted to be considered a highly essential manufacturer in a way like manufacturing semiconductors is indeed absolutely essential to the way that the world functions today um so for my next question i want you to kind of explain two things pradeep the first is um these highly optimized highly lean and agile supply chains as you put it how were they impacted by the covid-19 lockdowns um and more importantly within the broader geopolitical context um you briefly touched upon like huawei uh, uh, in in your um, in your article um and huawei was of course a major bone of contention between the us and china during the trade war uh, how exactly is this geopolitical rivalry between the world's major producers of electronic equipment uh, and the world's major consumers of electronic equipment going to change the kind of um, g- global supply networks that power the semiconductor industry in the years going forward right so one of the biggest risks that uh, this entire supply chain that i told you had was concentration risk which we talked about uh, also the over specialization risk right and the third one which is really important is the geopolitical risk and that's what is actually coming to the fore now right so what is happening is that the us now considers uh, china and huawei as a structural threat and semiconductors is one of those high tech sectors which it thinks that it needs to stop china from gaining dominance on right so even though china is uh, somewhat behind especially in the manufacturing thing taiwan is ahead but not china so uh, anyways they are developing cap- capabilities to get there and that's what us thinks it needs to stop china from doing right so that was the backdrop when covid-19 emerged so already us was thinking about how can it stop china from progressing uh, on these areas and then covid-19 hit now what does covid-19 change right it basically accelerates this process of thinking that you we need to go beyond this highly specialized comparative advantage driven supply chains that we have and instead it changes the uh, calculations of the decision makers in terms of developing more redundancy in terms of having more options other than china uh, or even taiwan in their own uh, country right so that's what yeah. it drives uh, home at so earlier the calculations of it's not that this is new everyone knew that it is uh, sort of uh, really uh, a very lean supply chain which might get hurt but there was no big event to drive home that point and now that covid-19 has happened uh, everyone is now realizing you know that this is a non resilient supply chain and now countries will be willing to put 
the money to develop uh, some of this uh, supply chains in house right so sub- build some redundancy in house so that's what is happening because of uh, covid 19 and uh, what we'll see going ahead is that this will basically intensify the use of semiconductor companies in the us china trade war w- what's happening now right so what mm-hmm. as even as we speak just a few days back uh us announced some export control measures okay so basically what it said is that uh tsmc uses some part of uh, equipment that goes from us so it uh, levied secondary sanctions on a tsmc saying that because you benefit from the components that us companies make you can't also manufacture uh, the chips which are given by huawei to you right so this is big hmm. uh, tsmc yeah, is yeah, a company it can do whatever it wants right it can take from many suppliers but uh, us has put secondary sanctions on uh, any company which has us uh, equipment above a particular threshold so this is what hmm. we are seeing uh, happening now uh, interestingly again this is not re- involving us but in uh, in uh, uk there is a company called imagination technologies and that manufactures the design and the ip which goes behind graphics processors in your phones okay in apple okay. and in a lot of phones so now uh, that imagination technology was uh, the control of the board of that company was uh, by an investor which was linked to the chinese party state so the uk government came in and stalled that process saying that hey this can't happen we have to the chinese party state cannot control this so what we are seeing is that this entire process of geopolitical rivalries is getting intensified after what has happened over the last few months it's so complex i mean i i really would not want to be in tsmc shoes right now mm. uh, having to constantly juggle um secondary sanctions especially just makes things so many more, so much more complicated because that means that you have to be extra careful not just about whom you're getting supplies from but also whom you're supplying to um and there's potentially there's so much potential for interference by any number of of not just major powers but also minor powers right um and i, I think this 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 brings me to really the biggest question in terms of um how this is going to change pranay because um while the us and china might have the ability to put sanctions uh, on these major suppliers uh, while they might even have the financial ability to kind of um build up their own domestic uh, capacity to build up that kind of resilience within their companies you talked for example about how um china is investing like billions of dollars in kind of building up that capacity what do smaller countries do like like um what does for example india do to make sure that uh, its supplies of semiconductors its supplies of chips are not impacted by this kind of geopolitical rivalry how do smaller countries uh, build up that kind of resilience in these supply chains right so that is a really tough uh, thing to do because as we know that the industry is so diversified across many countries so it's uh, it, it's and anyways india for example man, uh, just imports a lot of phones uh, and uh, uh, some parts of the phones like samsung does a, so a bit of manufacture so a bit of assembly in india for its phones but otherwise uh, phones like redmi etc just come directly from china but even though the hmm. chip would be manufactured say in taiwan or tsmc so we are in that particular stage but where we have the uh, comparative advantage in all this is high higher up the value chain in the design process which i talked about like i said because yeah. of government's fdi policies earlier there are a lot of us companies european companies which made bangalore their base for design right and a lot of good uh, high end design happens out of bangalore and because of that happening 30 years back a lot of indian companies started by alumni from all these companies have also come up right so that is where our comparative advantage lies and in fact mm-hmm. most of the value in this entire value chain is in the design process not so much in the fabs etc but if you can uh, ace some design process you can actually extract a lot of value so that's our strength and indian should invest in that particular strength uh, make it easy for other companies across the world to set their bases here and we will see indian companies also arising from that particular process so that's where i think 
we should okay but i mean that's a very fair point um i think that what you're saying in terms of like india already having that kind of human capital um for moving higher up the value chain is a, is a good point um and of course india simply doesn't have those billions kind of lying around that it can funnel into creating these new kind of high end fabrication units and stuff like that um but at the same time think of um think of the far future think of a world where us china rivalry is heating up where it's kind of spilling into various domains where let's say let us let 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 me be absolutely mad here and say that let's say that china blockades taiwan mm. or let's say that china blockades the straits of malacca uh, the cutting off india from uh, not just from semiconductor chips from also, but also from uh, consumer electronics in general mm. um is there a case to be made for india kind of um building resilience lower down the value chain as well so for example entering into multinational conglomerates uh, perhaps working with other countries to make sure that it gets access to these kind of things perhaps investing in other countries uh, ventures that are trying to build this kind of resilience what do you think yeah absolutely like i do think over the long term we can think of say multi country consortiums and as i said right now because of this particular event a lot of uh, supply chain managers of these companies would be thinking how do i build resilience how do i ensure that we don't have everything in taiwan or china or japan or south korea how do we have more companies and more processes across the world right so that's where right. this entire change in mindset can help india so if there are multi country consortiums which are likely to invest in newer fabrication units if we can be a part of that then it, then it benefits us right uh, so that is one thing that we can do but i don't think that any in any case china or taiwan even if china blockades taiwan they would want to block the uh, export of uh, the these components to india because they benefit immensely from export right the whole thing about china and bris the uh, initiative is they are saying that you have to buy our products because we have excessive capacity right so it's not mm-hmm. in the shop, at least in the next 5 10 years i don't see them saying that you know we will not supply phones to you or things like that because it actually benefits them a lot more so that is unlikely to happen but i totally agree to your point that there over the long term we can think of multi country consortiums pro- probably think of sovereign wealth funds of other countries to try and invest in uh, fabrication units elsewhere uh, and not just in china or in taiwan Hmm. All right cool thank you so much Pranay um I will put a link to your op-ed in the show notes so I would highly recommend that all of our listeners go check it out thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for listening to all things policy If you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network you can tune into them on the IVM podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow IVM on social media The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila Inst or our website Takshashila dot org dot in. I hope you enjoyed that show. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money. It really has been a great week this week. We've had two of our first international cricketer show up. People who have played for their respective sides. We had W V Raman come on Edges and Sledges, the cricket podcast. If you haven't heard that, you should be listening to that if you enjoy cricket. It's really one of the best out there. And you should also definitely check out Monty Panesar, who showed up on Cider Says. Uh, that was another really interesting conversation that occurred. If you haven't been listening to a few of our shorter shows, please do that as well. Ashish Vidyarthi has been doing a great job for us. We got 30 episodes now on Begin the Journey. I think you really enjoyed that show. If you haven't listened to it, it helps you with like you know understanding what's going on in this tough time and how do you deal with it from a mental health perspective. We've also had some really fun stuff come up on the Smile India show. Shifa has been doing a lot of really good stories over there. Things would just make you happy, so definitely do check that out. And on the more serious side, make sure that you're checking out our regular shows like the Pragati podcast, All Things Policy. They're definitely going to keep you up to date on what's going on in this COVID world. And thanks for listening and we hope to catch you again next week. Namaskar. This is Ashish Vidyarthi. Yes, my friend, these are challenging times, but in these challenging times we can create something extraordinary. Do take time to listen to my podcast Begin the Journey, available on the IVM podcast website, app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Remember, 
we have a great opportunity called life. Cheers. <laughs>